Today, let's see one of the most amazing games in chess history. This was played between Robert Byrne and Bobby Fischer in 1963. Just to give you some context, Robert Byrne was an international master at that time, and within a year, he became a grandmaster. So, he was quite a strong player. Bobby Fischer too, was on a winning streak, having won all his 10 games before this, so he was also on a roll. Robert was playing as white, and Bobby Fischer was playing with the black pieces. So, after the first few moves, we have the king's Indian on the board. Both players look to foreshadow their kingside bishops. But before that, Bobby plays c6, in order to establish his claim in the center. If he would have played bishop g7 first, white could have gotten e4, with the support of this bishop, and then, d5 would have been a challenge against this strong pawn trio. Therefore, in this position, he went for c6 first, bishop g2, and then d5, attacks the center. Byrne took the pawn, and Fischer takes back. We have reached the symmetrical variation of the Grunfeld defense. This is considered to be a drawish kind of a setup, but let's see what happens next. Robert plays knight c3, and finally, Fischer plays bishop g7. After this, we see some natural development moves from both sides. And finally, white also castles on the king side. Just to give you an insight into the players' minds, Robert Byrne was looking to play safe, and avoid making any fancy moves. He was aware that Bobby was on a winning streak, and will definitely play for a win. So, he tried playing a controlled game, and the next two moves, he just copied, what Bobby played here. b6, b3. Bishop a6, and bishop a3. The game is almost in the balance at this moment, and that's how Robert wanted it to be. He was waiting for Bobby to force a win, and maybe that could be an opportunity for Byrne. Even, if you look at this position, it's so symmetrical. Look at all these pieces, they are all identical, placed on the exact same squares. We are only 11 moves into the game, and if I tell you, that in the next 10 moves this game would be over, would you believe me? Well, that's exactly what happened. Fisher went for rook e8. Made perfect sense, since this pawn was pinned to the rook, and now he is ready to push this pawn forward. Queen d2 follows, the rooks are now connected. Fisher pushes e5 as expected, attacking the d4 pawn. Fisher later confessed that, he was a little concerned about weakening this queen pawn, but he believed that, he could put a lot of pressure with all his minor pieces, so it was worth it. He desperately wanted to win this, and felt that something natural like e6, could lead to a draw. Therefore, he went for the attacking e5. White takes, black recaptures, and now comes a decisive moment of this game. Getting the rook here, to attack this pawn, is something that most good players would think of. But the big question is, which rook do you get here? This one, or this one? Let's try, and analyze the pros and cons of both. Getting this rook here, seems most logical, because you free yourself from this pin. Also, this rook can be used later, to attack along this open c file. Therefore, Robert also went for, rook f to d1. But as it turns out, this was the wrong rook to move. Actually, this rook was performing a very important task, of defending this f2 square. You might think, what's happening to this pawn? There are no attacks at the moment. Well, you will understand its importance in a few minutes. Let's move on. Fisher went for another attacking move, knight to d3, completely blocking off both these pieces from taking a shot at the center. Just look at this knight, enjoying such an important place, and attacking all these squares. Byrne obviously had to do something about this, so he decided to move away his queen, throwing an attack on the knight, with his rook. And now, guess what Fisher plays here? He goes for the knight's sacrifice, by taking on f2. See, I was talking about this square earlier, and now we have the knight there. Had this rook been here, he could have easily captured with the rook, but now he is forced to take with the king. Alright, so we have this position now. Had it been Mikhail Tall, you would probably see another sacrifice here, but that's not how Fisher played. Bobby went for a check with his other knight. Advancing the king further, could be dangerous for white, so the king goes back. And now, Fisher jumps onto the e3 square. We have a family fork. Byrne obviously had to save his queen, so he played queen to d2. Fisher should obviously take the rook, right? But no, the next move came as a complete shocker to everyone. He took the bishop instead, even the commentators out there were not able to figure out the idea behind this move. Bobby's thinking was simple. He understood that this bishop, was way more powerful than the rook. The bishop was the only defender of this white king, so he eliminated that first. 
Actually, this is what I like the most about this game. As a viewer, you look at the most common and logical moves, but Bobby always came up with something different. He wasn't interested in slight improvements, he just wanted to go for the kill. And that's really fascinating to watch. Okay, so Robert obviously took the knight, and now we have d4 from Bobby, attacking this knight, but more importantly, opening up this diagonal for the bishop. Had he not played this, Byrne could have simply played knight to d4, and the position was locked. Fisher understood that, and he opened up the game. As I mentioned, Fisher was always looking for a win. Anyway, Byrne took this pawn, with his knight. And now, we see bishop b7 check. Where should this king move? h3 obviously does not make sense. If he goes to g1, then bishop d4 check. Queen takes, and now we have a nice little tactical idea. Can you find it? We deflect the rook, rook e1 check. If he takes with the rook, then the queen is gone. And if he does not take, then after this forced sequence of moves, he takes the rook, and ends up with a huge material advantage. Byrne figured that out and that's the reason why he didn't play king to g1. The move he played was king to f1. Looks all good for white, isn't it? In fact, the two grandmasters who were the commentators for this game, believed that this was a winning position for Byrne. Anyway, this was move number 21, and Fisher made the first move of his queen. At this point, both players shook hands and left the table. The game was over. Can you believe it? The commentators weren't too surprised, they believed that Fisher was down a piece, without adequate compensation. Hence, they were explaining to the live audience, that Bobby Fisher had resigned and lost the game. But later, they were shocked, when they came to know that it was actually Robert Byrne who had resigned. Funny story. Coming back to this game, but why did Byrne resign? Look. After queen d7, the obvious threat is queen h3 check. And as you can see, the rook is cutting off the e-file, the bishop is cutting off this diagonal, and the queen obviously is also coming in. So, even though white was up a piece, there wasn't really much Byrne could do. Later, Fisher mentioned that he was quite upset to not have this game completed. He was hoping for queen f2, which seems like the best defense for white. Queen to h3 check, king to g1. And now rook to e1 check. This is the brilliant move that everyone missed. Of course, queen can't take because of this checkmate. So rook takes. Then bishop takes knight, the queen is helpless. Again, he can't take because of the checkmate. And therefore, this queen is lost. A brilliant game, an interesting story. I believe, this is the best game of Bobby Fischer, even better than his game of the century. In fact, Bobby Fischer himself describes this, as one of his most memorable games. What do you think? Let me know in the comments section below. Here's an interesting chess puzzle for you all. Can you solve it? What is the best move for black in this position? Give your answers in the comments section. If you like this video, give a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe, and click the bell icon for regular chess videos. Thanks for watching this video. See you all in the next video.